Good morning. Welcome to the Town Church online. So glad that you've chosen to join us this morning for our worship gathering. I'm going to begin this morning by reading a welcome over us all. To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares, to all who fail and desire strength, and to all who sin and need a savior, this church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus Christ, the ally of his enemies, the defender of the guilty, the justifier of the inexcusable, and the friend of sinners. We welcome you. At the start of our service each week, we begin with a call to worship, a scripture that we read to each other to remind us what we're gathered to do, and that's to worship a holy God, our almighty Father in heaven. So this morning, I'm gonna read from Psalm 105. Feel free to read along with me there where you are. Psalm 105 says, "'Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Amen, that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to rejoice in our great heavenly father because he is worth rejoicing in. Um, as we're about to sing in this song, He's a God who, when we cry to him, even in the midst of trials, he hears our voice. So let's sing to our Heavenly Father this morning. Let's rejoice in our God. Come and stand me. Come behold his power and glory, and with confidence draw me. For the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love. Beloved of the Lord, one with everlasting kindness, bought with sacrificial love, bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know the affections of a father who will never let them go. has walked this path before us, he is walking with us still, turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise, there is blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand amazed, rejoice, when you cry. Suffering, he will have. 
we do, we gather here this morning to rejoice in you, to rejoice that we have a heavenly father who in the midst of, of tragedy as well in the midst of triumph, as we sang, we can turn to. You hear our voice. God, we thank you that that is who you are, that you're a God that we can rejoice in, that we can come to. God, we praise you for who you are today. And it's in your holy name we pray. Good morning. Welcome to the Town Church. Uh, my name is Josh. Uh, I'm on staff here at the church. Um, at some point, it would really be good to meet you. Now, some of you that I do know back home, usually about this time of service, I start getting a text at home about my mustache. Uh, yes, I do have a mustache, and no, that's not sin. But we are going to talk a little bit about confession today. And so... Don't text me right now. This is the time that we actually spend confessing our sin. Uh, throughout your week and throughout my week, we, we praise God and we worship God, just like we're going to do today. But we also walk away from God. We also take steps and directions away from fellowship with him. And that's called sin. The Bible says even as believers, people who are made perfect in God's image, people made in God's image, we even do sin. And so today we're going to take a little bit of time during our service and confess sin. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a few minutes uh, to confess your sins. But first, I'm going to pray a prayer of confession over us. Pray with me. Merciful God, we have sinned. We have sinned in what we have thought and said, in the wrong we have done and the good we have not done. We have sinned in ignorance we have sinned in weakness, and we have sinned through our own deliberate fault. Today, we confess and turn to you. Forgive us for the sake of our merciful Savior, Jesus, and renew our lives to the glory of your name. The name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Right where you are, take a few moments and confess your sins to a merciful and loving God. Romans 3, 21 through 24 says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So as we just got through confessing what this verse says, that we have fallen short, we've sinned, fallen short of God's glory, of his standard for us. But thanks be to God for verse 24 that comes after that. It says that we're justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption in Christ Jesus. So even though we sin and we have sinned, God has imparted the righteousness of Christ to our account for those of us who believe, who have faith in Him. And what a wonderful assurance that is to us as believers. So we're going to continue to sing, continue to confess in song that we have a great need of a Savior, and at the same time, glory in the Savior that we have in Jesus Christ, that He is our righteousness for us. So would you sing with us?
So we have just gotten through singing and declaring about how God, even in his holiness, made a way for us to be reconciled to him through Christ. And at the same time, he's reconciled us back to himself as children of the Almighty God. We've also been reconciled together into God's family as brothers and sisters in Christ. So normally each week when we are gathered together, we take a few moments to greet one another, to welcome each other the same way that we've been welcomed into God's family. And we want to do that today. So I'm going to give you all just a couple of minutes. Take a few minutes and text one or two people that you know, maybe people from your township or friends that you have within our body, and tell them that you are glad that they are a part of our body together with us. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you again this morning. My name is Vince. I'm one of the elders here at the town church. I um, am a pastor here, pastor of preaching and and casting vision for us as a church. Um, I'll say this, I I can't wait to meet you. So if I haven't yet uh, met you, I can't wait to meet you in person one day. Hopefully that day is coming soon. And and I'll, I'll start here from the very beginning yet again. Um, to say, and just because we say this every week and and often doesn't mean that it's not true. We are, um, we we miss you. We miss being with you. We miss um, being around you and miss having you here on Sunday mornings. We really want to be with you. We're anxiously awaiting that day. Uh, I want to encourage you, um, uh, some of you who have been Uh, sticking with this video worship. Some of you who've been sticking with video townships, our small groups, uh, video Bible studies, video gatherings of of all kinds. I want to encourage you on on the one hand, um, let me me say this, I'm sorry. Sorry that that's where we are right now. It's sad that we cannot be together. Uh, We've got to be in front of screens trying to do this interaction. But but on the other hand, um, we're hopeful that Uh, enduring through this, and it is an endurance, enduring through this new um, together uh, in front of screens, uh, our hope is that that it is producing fruit, that it's producing fruit uh, among us. Our hope is that uh, the community, that community is still being built and and that we're still um, growing together in our affections for Jesus, that those are still increasing, even though we're in uh, in this um, interesting season. That's our hope. That's our desire. That has been our prayer. In fact, every uh, week, at uh, every day at noon during the week, we pray. And as we gather to pray, we've prayed for endurance. Uh, Through this time, we've prayed for God to be at work among us, and and we long for that prayer to be answered, that God would be at work among us. We're just continuing to pray that. And so um, I want to invite you in this way, if you're struggling right now in whatever way that is, would you contact us and let us know how we can be praying for you? We we want to do that. So if there's any struggle in, in your life, whether that be um, uh, just emotional, mental, um, financial, uh, relational, uh, 
Maybe it's just that you're, you're lonely. If you're struggling, would you let us know so that we can be praying with you and, and for you? We, we want to do that, okay? Um, our, as a church, what we've done for years is, is we've walked through the Bible to see more of God, uh, to see more of how he's drawing people to himself for, through the work uh, of Jesus and through the Spirit. And, and so currently we're in a season where we are walking through the gospel account of John. And so if you'd go ahead and grab a Bible wherever you are, grab a, a Bible and make your way to the book of John. John is in the New Testament. So The New Testament is the back half of your Bible. Uh, You've got um, four accounts, four gospel accounts that that look at the life and and death of Jesus. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. So make your way to the book of John. We're in chapter 6 this morning, and we'll finish out the last 13 verses of chapter 6 together. And let me just catch us all up to speed, get us all on the same page. Here's what's happened so far in 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 the last couple weeks. Jesus has gotten away with his disciples, so he's, he's um, gotten up into the hill country with his disciples, probably just the 12 disciples, and a giant crowd follows them, and they find them. Maybe uh, upwards of 20,000 people find Jesus and his disciples, and, and Jesus miraculously feeds the crowd of people, and they're wowed by what Jesus has done for them. And they, they want to claim him as, as a prophet, the prophet that was, uh, that, that's to, to be coming. And they want to crown him as their own king. And so um, with that, Jesus dodges the crowd and, and escapes with his disciples to the other side of the Sea uh, of Galilee. Small detail here, Jesus walks on water, right? Uh, but but you'll, you can read about that. Um, they get to Capernaum, and, and Jesus goes to the synagogue there. And, and while he's there, the crowd chases him down. They want to be near Jesus. We saw this last week. Uh, The reason they want to be near him is so that they can get what he provides. They they want a personal chef. They want someone to do neat tricks and provide for for them. And so here's what happens. That opens the door for Jesus to talk to them about what God is up to and, and, and to talk to them about what true faith is. That a life of faith is a gift of God, and, and it's one of feasting on Jesus, and, and it's one of being satisfied in Jesus and everything that he's accomplished. If you were with us last week, you'll, you'll remember that seeking Jesus is not the same as belief in Jesus. Right? Seeking Jesus is not the same. Just having a desire to be around Jesus because of, of the benefits that he gives is not the same as a deep belief in Jesus that leads then to worship. It's not the same. And that brings us to the text this week, this morning, starting in verse 59. And so I'm going to invite you, if you're able this morning, right there in your living room, if you're able to join us um, in standing As we read from God's Word, I'm going to invite you to do that. Um, We'll read from verse 59 all the way down to verse 71. So starting in verse 59 of chapter 6, here's here's what's said. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. This is God's word. 
Well, here's where I'll start this morning. I'll start with an analogy that will break down. You'll see where it breaks down, but all analogies break down at some point, all right? So here, here's my analogy. I'll ask a question. How many of you have been uh, repelling? You know what re- repelling is? You know what I'm talking about with repelling, where you're wearing a harness that's really uncomfortable and maybe a little more revealing than it ought to be, hooking into a, a rope and, and backing slowly off the edge of a cliff, right? That, that's what repelling is. That, that's not easy, is it? it to, to get your brain to a place of being okay with you backing over the side of a cliff, that, that's not easy, right? To get your brain to do that, to, to communicate to your body, no, go ahead and do that, right? And, and if you've done this, it, there's an instructor always at the top who, who makes you look like a, a doofus, right? And, and that instructor always tells you Um, that that at the very beginning of this, that that it's best, as you're heading over the edge, it's best to not move your feet, right? Don't move your feet, just keep leaning backwards, right? In in other words, he's saying, don't do what's natural, right? Don't grab onto the rope up here because you feel like you're quickly falling off the cliff. Don't do that. Instead, keep one hand just sort of loosely planted at at the small of your back on the rope and, and and just lean back, right? That, that's what the instructor says. But that's not easy, is it? Getting your brain to tell your body to do unnatural things when there's danger crumbling beneath your feet to the ground below is not easy. It's not an easy thing. Right? There, there's nothing easy about getting your brain to tell your body to repel. Re- repelling is a battle between your brain your limbs, your natural instinct, and this thing called gravity and death, right? It's not easy. But listen, while repelling is not easy, repelling is simple. It really is simple, right? It's a rope tied to an anchor at the top, uh, strung through an apparatus on your harness that uses friction to slow you down. That's it, right? Repelling is not easy, but it is simple. Right, so here's where the analogy breaks down. But belief in Jesus is not easy. But belief in Jesus is simple. I think that's what we see in this passage. That's what Jesus is getting at with a, a larger group of disciples and then a smaller group of the disciples near, near the end, the twelve. Uh, belief in Jesus is not easy, but it's pretty simple. Now, I think we see that in this text. I'll, I'll explain that as we go, but this is meant to be an encouragement to us. That, that's my hope, that this is an encouragement to us, and, and maybe uh, for some of us, it's a call to believe. And I, I think for all of us in this passage, in the context of John, in the context of the Bible, in the context of life that we're now living, this passage is meant to lead us to greater affections for Jesus. First, I think we we see this, that belief in Jesus is not easy. Belief in Jesus is not easy. We're told in in verse 59 that Jesus said all of these things, the the things that we looked at last week in the synagogue, in Capernaum, all of these people have gathered around. They want more from Jesus, and, and he unloads on them the beauty of the gospel that there is nothing we are able to do, but, but, but God is the one at work. No one would run to Jesus and no one would believe without God drawing them to believe. If not for God causing belief in us, we would not believe. Right now, that's not in us naturally. Right? That's not in us sinfully. Unbelief and doubt and a whole lot of, hey, I think I can do this on my own, it is, is stirring through us. I, I think I can do what I need to do to earn God's favor on my own it is stirring. and That's what's in us. But to believe that there is nothing we can do that gives us access to God, to believe that God is the one who's drawing us to believe in Jesus with the faith that he's giving us, given us as a satisfying gift, to believe that our lives are to be lives of feasting on the goodness of Jesus. And we wouldn't do that on our own, but God causes that in us. That's not easy to, to consider. That's not easy. That's what Jesus' disciples say in verse 60, this bigger crowd of disciples, followers, learners, 
say in verse 60, right? This, this larger group that, that is gathered around, not the 12, but a bigger group, they say in verse 60, uh, it says, many of Jesus' disciples heard all of what he, what he has just said, and they respond how? Look at it. Uh, this is a hard saying. Or, or more literally, this is a harsh and offensive saying. Who can listen to this? Now, why is it harsh? Why is it offensive? Here's why. Because everything that Jesus has said, what we, what we looked at last week, everything that Jesus has said removes them from the equation. And that's hard, hard for them to understand. That's hard for them to comprehend. And in a lot of ways, it minimizes what they've always held on to as their significance. It's removed them from the equation. Right? Moses, he's our leader. He's the one who got us bread from heaven. He worked to, to bring that. Right? Bread from heaven, that only comes from God. Right? Uh, isn't this Mary and Joseph's son? How does he now say he's from God, from, from heaven? Really bread that, that I can eat and I'll never be hungry again? How is this guy going to provide that for me? I've always done that on my own. Hey, listen, our ancestors are important. Right? They're, they're significant. And you just treat them like no big deal. You said, oh, they ate manna and they died. Right? That's how you're going to treat our ancestors. But, but you say you can give us eternal life and, and, and you're more important than them, giving us something that's lasting, uh, it, it lasting and, and, and that's from God. Oh, oh, wait, now you're telling me that I have to eat your flesh and drink your blood and that's how I get life? That comes from you? Really? I've done nothing? This all is from you, really? And so do you see what Jesus has done? He stripped away everything that gave them significance. Everything that they held on to as important for their position with God. And he says, no, that's not from you. That that's from me, not from your ancestors, not from your way of life, not from anything that you could do. That that's from me. And that's not easy for them to hear. In fact, it's offensive. And Jesus knows these disciples, these learners, this larger group, and he knows that they're offended. And he says in verse 61, do you take offense at this? Are, are you offended? Now, just pause for a second here. As an aside, and you know it when I say as an aside, it's going to be a longer thing, and, and it's I think, kind of going to be um, a, me a meaningful piece. But, but as an aside, Jesus knew that they were offended without them telling him they were offended. He knew that about them. Right? Jesus, here's what I think we get from that. Jesus knows what's in our hearts. Not just what we look like, your hair color and all, all that. Jesus knows what's in your hearts. He knows what's in the hearts of these disciples. We're, we're told, I mean, this goes all the way through the book of John. We're told in, in chapter 1 of Nathaniel that Jesus knew him before he even saw him. We're told of Nicodemus in chapter 3 that Jesus knows his heart. We're told in, in chapter 4 that Jesus knew the Samaritan woman, had five husbands. He, he knows these people. We're told here in chapter 6 that Jesus knew they were offended and grumbling. He knows our hearts. And so can I encourage you, can I encourage us, myself included, toward this this morning? Th those things that he knows about your heart, speak those things to him. He, he already knows your heart. He knows where, where you've been discouraged. And he knows where you've doubted. And he knows that you've been frustrated and why you've been frustrated. And he knows that You've gotten to this place of real discouragement that things aren't going the way that you had hoped them to be going. And he knows also that, that you're frustrated by the fact that he's the one in control and you don't like that. He knows what's going on in your heart. And so I think the encouragement that I would give to us is speak that to him and ask him for help and say to him, Jesus that b b belief in you is not easy. Everything in me pushes against uh, letting go of my tight grasp on, on what I want to be happening in my life right now. This is not easy, Jesus. Speak that to him. What have you 
uh, been going through in these last days and weeks? Has your faith been challenged? Has your patience been stretched? Have you had to endure things you never thought you would have to endure? Have you, have you had to let go of dreams and aspirations you once held on to tightly? Have you had to endure things on and on and on that you wouldn't have thought you would have to endure like this, like, like um, loss of friendships or, or at least uh, losing touch with friends you have been in touch with for so long? Have relationships now become strained and hard and difficult and cha- challenging in all kinds of ways? Has your desire to grow in community just fizzled out? Has your faith been challenged? Is your job on the line? Is your business unstable? Is your, is your mental health, your, your emotional health all over the place? Don't even know if it's healthy or not. Has your faith been challenged? Has your belief in, in that Jesus is still the reigning king, has that faith diminished? Can we just agree on something here? That, that belief in Jesus is not easy. Belief in Jesus is not easy. And, and so my question is, have you taken the time to speak that to him? There's, there's something about the idea of lament in, in a season like this, grieving over the fact that things are not the way they were meant to be, but, but speaking those to the one who hears us and, and restores us. Lament. Lament in times where our faith is challenged is right. Lament in times where our faith is challenged is appropriate and it's good. Have you taken the time to do that? I said this a few weeks ago, but something we've done for for years really as a family and not just during this quarantine, but for years. And by the way, we're on something like day 50 where we've kind of walked through this uh, together every evening together as a family we sit down and we each go around and we we say one thing that we're thankful that God has has done or he's provided or he's 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 given us what we've also though in this season taken some time to lament I'm trying to teach my five boys what that looks like Kirsten and I are doing that to talk about the things we've lost here's some of the hard things we've lost and here's some of the things we've missed and here's some of the things that have been hard and and then right after we talk through that we take those things to God and we say God would you help are you taking the time to do that belief in Jesus is not easy walking this life of faith in Jesus is not easy in large part because it's out of our control right and so Jesus speaks he speaks to the disciples frustration and their uh, offense and he says in verse 62 what if you were to see the son of man ascending to where he was before would that help but what if you were to see the son of man uh, me jesus uh, ascending to where he was before to, to god the father and, and and here's what jesus is getting at to see him there means he had to ascend there, and and if he ascends there, he has to first accomplish what he set out to do. And and what did he come to earth to do? Right To, To ascend to the Father, what did he have to do? He had to die. He had to first ascend to the cross. He had to die, he had to be crucified, he had to be buried, and then he had to be raised from the dead so that he could ascend. And so that's what Jesus is getting at. He says, I see that you're offended. I see that you're offended. These things aren't easy to, to, to grasp. Would it help if you were able to see all of what I came to accomplish? Would that help? And it's kind of rhetorical because, again, Jesus knows the hearts and he knows that those, um, for those who are doubting, those who are uh, offended disciples, that that wouldn't help. Belief doesn't come because of seeing some answer, does it? But belief doesn't come because of seeing some proof. Belief in Jesus isn't easy. It's not easy. We saw last week that that God is the one who who grants that. And so Jesus says in verse 63, it's the Spirit's work to give life. The flesh doesn't help at all. 
The, the flesh doesn't help at all. Jesus says, the words that I've spoken are spirit and life. Or in other words, Jesus is saying, the words I've spoken aren't about what you have to do. You're still in that place. It's not about what you have to do. The words I've spoken are about what the Spirit of God is doing in you to draw you to believe and to have life. The flesh is no help at all in that. And in fact, in a lot of ways, the flesh is working against us when it comes to belief, right? Go back to my repelling analogy. Everything in your body, everything in your flesh is working against you backing off the cliff, right? When it comes to belief in Jesus, it's not easy and your flesh is working against you because belief isn't a matter of, of, of what your flesh produces. It's a matter of what the Spirit is doing in you and on you. The Apostle Paul speaks to this dilemma in Romans 7. Oh, this is such an encouragement to my heart. In fact, I'd encourage you to, to read um, through the end of Romans 7 this week. Just take some time to, to read through that and see this dilemma And Paul just walks through that. He says he doesn't understand his own actions. I don't even understand my own actions at times because at times I do the things that I don't want to do. And the very things I hate are there because sin dwells in me. And I have a desire to do what is right, but I don't have the ability to carry that out. And so you see this dilemma in Paul that he just talks to. It's so encouraging for me to hear that someone like Paul, a hero in the faith, is wrestling through this dilemma. And Paul knows that if anything good comes from him, it's from the Spirit, not from his flesh. This is what Jesus says in verse 63. If the Spirit who gives life, it's the Spirit who gives life, you aren't bringing real lasting abiding life to yourself at all through anything you could do. The flesh isn't helpful there. That's so counter to what we hold on to, isn't it? Belief in Jesus A life of faith in Jesus is not easy. And so Jesus says to the disciples, these these learners, this larger group in verse 64, there are some of you who do not believe. And then John inserts this parenthetical. He says Jesus knew who would believe and who wouldn't and who would end up betraying him. A little foreshadowing there. Sorry to ruin the story, but, but he knows that. And, and then Jesus points back to something he's already said. He says in verse 65, this is why I told you no one can come to me unless it's granted by the Father, unless the Father's drawing him in. That, that's God's work through the Spirit. That comes from God, and that too pushes against everything that's in us. We want control, don't we? We want that. But it's not ours. Belief in Jesus and everything that, that, that he's come to teach and everything about the life he's come to live, belief in Jesus is not easy. A life of faith in Jesus is not easy. Ah, oh, man, I wish there was a hearty amen there. Jeremiah, can you help me out? Even from home, just say amen somewhere in, in your home. Faith isn't easy, is it? I, I think for, for too long we've put up this front as as Christians, as if, as if the Christian life needs to be put together and polished and, and no one can have any issues with faith, right, with, with belief. There's no wavering, no doubting, no valleys, just mountaintop experiences all the time. I think we've put that up for too long and that's destroyed so many people belittling their place in, in life. And I think often what comes from that then is, is this response where we would say, well, I guess I just won't talk about how I'm really doing. I, I guess I won't talk about how I'm really doing because everyone else who, who speaks in these sort of Christian circles talks about how well their faith in Jesus is going. Belief isn't easy. Can we just settle there? Faith in Jesus is not always easy. This is something I was so pleased by last week when we had our our first ever post-Sunday morning gathering. All right, some of uh, affectionately or annoyingly called it the lobby. Um, whether or not that name sticks, right? We're hanging out in the lobby after church. I, I don't know if that'll stick. But anyway, there, there were close to 20 people on a Zoom call last Sunday uh, just talking about what God had been doing in them. Uh, God is doing some amazing things in a lot of people among our, our church family. So if you, you haven't been, been a, a part of that, I'll tell you now, God's doing some amazing things in, in hearts and uh, lives uh, of people, growing them and challenging them in, in some really good ways. But 
But, there's a but there, there were also some honest tears last week. And many who are struggling, right? And and just just saying it like it is, right? There there were some who just said it like it was. Things are hard, they they would say. Things are challenging. Marriage has been tricky. Parenting has been hard. Lack of relationships is lonely, extremely lonely. We don't like it. Faith has been wavering in some, and jobs and businesses are not doing well. I was so encouraged to just hear the, the, the responses from people together as we talk. Can we just all agree that, that belief in Jesus, this life of faith in Jesus, is not easy, especially when we put all of the weight on ourselves to pull it together? And so can I encourage us this morning... If you have 30 minutes after our, our gathering, at 11.30, we're going to do that again just to hear stories of others, to share our own stories of what God is doing, that belief in Jesus is not always easy, and we desperately need one another to hear that, to, to just resonate together through that. More than ever, we're probably feeling that, right? that we need one another. We're, we're feeling that. We cannot walk this alone. We're drawn to Jesus because God is doing a work in us through the Spirit, but that doesn't mean that things are going to be easy from that point on, right? We need one another. And just like in these verses, there are going to be some who, who don't believe, right? There, there are going to be some who, in, in the middle of a, a crisis, that, that are going to doubt and, and take off. Now, I, I don't say that to cause fear in any of you. I, I don't say that to, to cause fear. That, that It's just a reality, Right? We, we know that, that, that not everyone will believe. You know, you've experienced that. People close to you, who you thought were, were, were followers of Jesus, have, have taken off. You've experienced that. And in verse 66, we're told that many of his disciples turned and no longer walked with Jesus. That's heartbreaking. That many of these learners who had been listening in, who had heard some of these hard things from Jesus, they were out. We've experienced that. Again, this is not here to cause doubt and fear. I'm not not putting that in front of us to cause doubt and fear. Who is it? Is it me? Is it? That's not why. It's a reality that not everyone will believe. And if if you do believe, it's because God has drawn you to Jesus and given you faith to believe. Right? So, So Jesus asks his smaller inner circle group of 12 in verse 67. He brings it in. In verse 67, he says, do you want to go away as well? Here's your chance. Do you want to jet as well? Are you out as well? It's almost as if Jesus is affirming. Belief isn't easy. Do you want out as well? Because if you do, here it is. Here's the out. And we're told that Simon Peter answers, which if you've read the New Testament at all, you know that this is um, typical of Peter, right, you, you'll, you'll know that, that if there's an opportunity to talk, Peter is going to talk, right? He's the guy on Zoom who never has his audio muted, right? Just for the opportunity to say something. He's going to jump in and say something. He's ready to go. So Peter jumps in to answer uh, Jesus' question where Jesus says, do you want to go away as well? And I love his response. Lord, to whom shall we go? Or, or what, what would we do? Right? Where are we supposed to go? I think it's a beautiful response to that question. But what are we supposed to do? And here, here's what I want us to see, that, that in times where we, we experience belief in Jesus not being easy, I think we also have to see that belief in Jesus is simple. And here's what I mean. I just allow that to sink in. Here, here's what I mean by that. Imagine right now in your life, if Jesus said to you, are you ready to give up? Are you ready to walk? Belief in Jesus is simple. It's as simple as confessing, Lord, where would I go? Confessing, Lord, that you are my master, where would I go? Look at, look at what he says in verse 67. Where would I go? You have the words. This is Peter. Where would I go? You have the words of eternal life. 
And we have believed and have come to know and experience that you are God. Where, where would we go, Lord? Eternal life, true lasting life is only found in you. Belief in Jesus is that simple. It's, it's an open-handed confession. Lord, Master, where would I go to find anything of real life except for in you? Jesus responds to Peter and says, Peter, didn't I choose you? As if, as if to say, you're right, there is nowhere else you would go, and, and you couldn't because I chose you to be with me. That that's Jesus grabbing on and saying, I'm not letting you go. I'm not leaving you. You're with me. I've grabbed on to you. You're mine. And then John the writer ends out the chapter for us, writing decades probably after the, this event. He, he gives us a detail because he's looking back, and he says, one of the disciples will betray, and that, that betrayer is Judas. Now listen, friends, here's, here's where we'll, we'll wrap all this up. Um, belief in Jesus is not easy. Uh, there are absolutely ups and downs, and there are confusing things to try to figure out, and maybe we will never figure those things out. And there are truths about how God draws us to Jesus, and he calls us his own, and, and those things are not easy to comprehend. For the person who says, oh, I've got that figured out, I think you should doubt that person. These things are not easy to comprehend. A life of faith in Jesus is not easy, but we also have to see that belief in Jesus is simple. It's as simple as an open-handed confession of saying, Jesus, you're my Lord. Where else, where else would I go? Would you allow that to hit this morning? Allow that to sink into your heart this morning. Maybe you're in a place this morning where, where your faith is flourishing, Right? where you sense the presence of Jesus as very near. And I've talked to some of you, and that's where you are, right? where you've just sensed the presence of Jesus very near to you in these days. And I still think asking the question may be appropriate. You just let that run through your heart and your head. Jesus, where else would I go? But I think then, then you follow that up with an answer. Praise be to God that I have nowhere else to go but to you. You're with me, sincerely. That, that, that ought to mark, mark your life, that, that you're in a place where you would say, I have nowhere to go. And then that would then overflow in gratitude and, and worship. So if you're in a place where your faith is flourishing, praise be to God. But, but this morning, if your faith is shaky, if your faith is wavering, if you've had doubts, if you've felt weak in your faith. Maybe that's where you are right now. Have you ever just felt blah? Of course you have, right? It may be good to put the same conversation out there for yourself as well, where you would say, well, I may be feeling kind of blah, but where else would I go to find peace? Maybe even ask the question aloud, like this catechism, this question answer where you say the question, you repeat the answer, this back and forth. Maybe just say the question out loud. Who can I run to that would truly satisfy me? Right? Does anyone know what I need? Does anyone know what I'm feeling? Has anyone faced the same kind of pain and heartache I've faced? Has anyone felt the, the kind of loneliness that I've experienced? Has anyone felt that? Is there anyone out there? Has anyone uh, been betrayed by a good friend like I've been betrayed by a good friend? Maybe just ask those questions aloud. And, and maybe even spend some time writing those questions out. And as you think about those questions, can I encourage you then to, to turn to Isaiah 53 and, and, and then read about the one, the one who is the answer to those questions. Spend some time doing that this week. The, the one who is the answer to those questions. Is there anyone out there? Because when you get to Isaiah 53, you, you see this uh, prophesied one, Jesus, who was despised and rejected by men, who is acquainted with grief, 
who, who bears our grief, who carries our sorrows, who was smitten by God, His own Father, who was pierced for our sin, who was crushed for our sin. His, Jesus' wounds would heal us. Jesus takes on our sin. It was laid on Him. Jesus was oppressed. He was afflicted. He, was, uh, he submitted to the will of God to be crushed. Jesus bears our sin. Jesus makes intercession possible. He reconciles us to God. He brings us peace. Jesus does that. Friend, could you, could you ask the question this morning? Maybe just say that out loud. Where else would I go? Belief in Jesus is as simple as as this answer. Where else would I go? To Jesus. He's the only one who is able to reconcile me to God, to clear me of guilt, to forgive me, and to give me a new identity. He's the only one. If your faith is wavering, I would encourage you to ask those questions and then answer them with the truths of Scripture. If you've never taken time to consider your need for Jesus, I think this morning is a great opportunity. I'll tell you this, though. Belief in Jesus is not an easy road. I'm not, I'm not saying, hey, just have faith in Jesus and, and all your wildest dreams will come true and things will be smooth sailing. There are trials, right? Backing off the edge of a cliff with a rope and a harness is not easy. Getting your brain to tell your body to back off is not easy. There's a lot going on there, voluntarily and involuntarily. Likewise, belief in Jesus is not easy. Opening up a tight grasp of the things you cannot control is not easy. Believing the unbelievable, that, that, that God's work is unseen, it, often it is not easy easy, but belief in Jesus is as simple as answering the question, where else are you going to go? Where else are you going to go? Is there anything else? But would you consider that this morning? And here's what I want to do. I want to, I want to pray for us, and, and then we're going to um, finish together after we pray by, by singing a, a song that, that asks some of these similar questions back and forth, questions that I think need to be asked, but the song also gives us answers, and they all point to one person who is the answer, and that's Jesus, that he's worthy of our worship. So let me pray for us, and we'll continue in song. Let's pray. God, this morning, uh, we come to a passage like this where we see a group of people who were, who were in, at least in, in terms of learning, but as Jesus calls them to, to deeper belief, that they have questions and doubts and fears, and, and some of them take off. And Jesus, we, we know from your words, you've, you've said that a life of following you is not easy, that we would lose things. That's just a part of it, that we would, that we would lose identity in the things we thought were important, that we would lose relationship, that we would lose um, this and that, that thing. You've told us that a life of following you is not easy. Belief in you is not easy. But we also see from Peter's response to Jesus' question, do you want to go too? Do you want to take off? That, that the, the response to that, where else would I go? Faith in you is, is that simple. Jesus, our eyes are fixed on you. And where they're not, would you help them to be fixed on you? Would you help us? Would you draw us in to believe more and more? For those whose faith is flourishing, God, would you encourage them? And would you help them to be an encouragement to others? Sustain them. Help them to endure. For those who are wavering and, and, and are on shaky ground and are and are questioning, God, would you, would you help them to believe where, where they don't believe? And for those who have never considered Jesus as one to be following, God, would you stir in them a desire to, to move toward Jesus and to believe? That's a work of you. And so would you do that, God, we pray. And, and for, for all of us, whoever's listening in this morning, for all of us, would you give us greater affections for Jesus? seeing so clearly that, that he's worthy of all of our worship. Help us to believe that this morning.
Amen. Do you feel the world is broken? shadows deepen But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through We do Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do
Well, every Sunday we end our time together sending one another off with a benediction, with a blessing. And while we may not be sending one another off too far because we're all at home, um, we, we do send one another off with a blessing. We speak a blessing over one another. And I think as we've thought through some of the things we've thought through today about um, uh, believing who, who Jesus is and who he, he says he is, I think there can sometimes be some confusion, but, but, but all, all of that, a call to believe, God tells us that there should be peace. There's, there's peace there. So I want to speak that truth over one another this morning from Romans. And as a church, we've done this for years now. We raise a hand to bless those around us. You can put a hand on someone's shoulder to bless them. This is us blessing one another. We raise a hand to to bless one another, and we speak the truths of Scripture together. And so would you do that this morning and say these things with me from Romans 15? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And we all say together, amen. Amen. Have a great week.